Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 9 The Consequences of a Deviation Barbicane had now no fear of the issue of the journey, at least as far as the projectile's impulsive force was concerned. Its own speed would carry it beyond the neutral line. It would certainly not return to earth. It would certainly not remain motionless on the line of attraction. One single hypothesis remained to be realized, the arrival of the projectile at its destination by the action of the lunar attraction. It was, in reality, a fall of 8,296 leagues on an orb, it is true, where weight could only be reckoned at one-sixth of terrestrial weight, a formidable fall nevertheless, and one against which every precaution must be taken without delay. These precautions were of two sorts, some to deaden the shock when the projectile should touch the lunar soil, others to delay the fall and consequently make it less violent. To deaden the shock, it was a pity that Barbicane was no longer able to employ the means which had so ably weakened the shock at departure, that is to say, by water used as springs and the partition breaks. The partitions still existed, but water failed, for they could not use their reserve which was precious, in case during the first days the liquid element should be found wanting on lunar soil. And indeed this reserve would have been quite insufficient for a spring, the layer of water stored in the projectile at the time of starting upon their journey occupied no less than three feet in depth, and spread over a surface of not less than fifty-four square feet. Besides, the cistern did not contain one-fifth part of it. They must therefore give up this efficient means of deadening the shock of arrival. Happily, Barbicane, not content with employing water, had furnished the movable disc with strong spring plugs, destined to lessen the shock against the base after the breaking of the horizontal partitions. These plugs still existed. They had only to readjust them and replace the movable disc. Every piece, easy to handle, as their weight was now scarcely felt, was quickly mounted. The different pieces were fitted without trouble, it being only a matter of bolts and screws. Tools were not wanting, and soon the reinstated disc lay on steel plugs like a table on its legs. One inconvenience resulted from the replacing of the disc. The lower window was blocked up. Thus it was impossible for the travelers to observe the moon from that opening while they were being precipitated perpendicularly upon her. But they were obliged to give it up. Even by the side openings they could still see vast lunar regions as an aeronaut sees the earth from his car. This replacing of the disc was at least an hour's work. It was past twelve when all preparations were finished. Barbicane took fresh observations on the inclination of the projectile, but to his annoyance it had not turned over sufficiently for its fall. It seemed to take a curve parallel to the lunar disc. The orb of night shone splendidly into space, while opposite the orb of day blazed with fire. Their situation began to make them uneasy. "'Are we reaching our destination?' said Nicol. "'Let us act as if we were about reaching it,' replied Barbicane. "'You are skeptical,' retorted Michael Arden. "'We shall arrive, and that too quicker than we like.' This answer brought Barbicane back to his preparations— and he occupied himself with placing the contrivances intended to break their descent. We may remember the scene of the meeting held at Tampa Town in Florida, when Captain Nicholl came forward as Barbicane's enemy and Michael Arden's adversary. To Captain Nicholl's maintaining that the projectile would smash like glass, Michael replied that he would break their fall by means of rockets properly placed. Thus, powerful fireworks, taking their starting point from the base and bursting outside, could, by producing a recoil, check to a certain degree the projectile's speed. These rockets were to burn in space, it is true, but oxygen would not fail them, for they could supply themselves with it, like the lunar volcanoes, the burning of which has never yet been stopped by the want of atmosphere around the moon." Barbicane had accordingly supplied himself with these fireworks, enclosed in little steel guns, 
which could be screwed on to the base of the projectile. Inside, these guns were flush with the bottom. Outside, they protruded about eighteen inches. There were twenty of them. An opening left in the disc allowed them to light the match with which each was provided. All the effect was felt outside. The burning mixture had already been rammed into each gun. They had, then, nothing to do but raise the metallic buffers fixed in the base, and replace them by the guns, which fitted closely in their places. This new work was finished about three o'clock, and after taking all these precautions there remained but to wait. But the projectile was perceptibly nearing the moon, and evidently succumbed to her influence to a certain degree, though its own velocity also drew it into an oblique direction. From these conflicting influences resulted a line which might become a tangent, but it was certain that the projectile would not fall directly on the moon, for its lower part, by reason of its weight, ought to be turned toward her. Barbicane's uneasiness increased as he saw his projectile resist the influence of gravitation. The unknown was opening before him, the unknown in interplanetary space. The man of science thought he had foreseen the only three hypotheses possible, the return to the earth, the return to the moon, or stagnation on the neutral line. And here a fourth hypothesis, big with all the terrors of the infinite, surged up inopportunely. To face it without flinching, one must be a resolute savant like Barbicane, a phlegmatic being like Nicol, or an audacious adventurer like Michael Arden. Conversation was started upon this subject. Other men would have considered the question from a practical point of view. They would have asked themselves whither their projectile carriage was carrying them. Not so with these. They sought for the cause which produced this effect. "'So we have become diverted from our route,' said Michael. "'But why?' "'I very much fear,' answered Nicholl, "'that, in spite of all precautions taken, the Columbiad was not fairly pointed. An error, however small, would be enough to throw us out of the moon's attraction.' "'Then they must have aimed badly?' asked Michael. "'I do not think so,' replied Barbicane. "'The perpendicularity of the gun was exact, its direction to the zenith of the spot incontestable, and the moon passing to the zenith of the spot, we ought to reach it at the full. There is another reason, but it escapes me.' "'Are we not arriving too late?' asked Nicholl. "'Too late?' said Barbicane. "'Yes.' continued Nicholl. The Cambridge Observatory's note says that the transit ought to be accomplished in ninety-seven hours, thirteen minutes, and twenty seconds, which means to say that sooner the moon will not be at the point indicated, and later it will have passed it. True, replied Barbicane, but we started the first of December at thirteen minutes and twenty-five seconds to eleven at night, and we ought to arrive on the fifth at midnight, at the exact moment when the moon would be full and we are now at the 5th of December. It is now half-past three in the evening. Half-past eight ought to see us at the end of our journey. Why do we not arrive? Might it not be an excess of speed? answered Nicholl, for we know now that its initial velocity was greater than they supposed. No, a hundred times no, replied Barbicane. An excess of speed, if the direction of the projectile had been right, would not have prevented us reaching the moon. No, there has been a deviation. We have been turned out of our course. By whom? By what? asked Nicholl. I cannot say, replied Barbicane. Very well, then, Barbicane, said Michael. Do you wish to know my opinion on the subject of finding out this deviation? Speak. I would not give half a dollar to know it. That we have deviated is a fact. Where we are going matters little, we shall soon see. Since we are being born along in space, we shall end by falling into some center of attraction or other. Michael Arden's indifference did not content Barbicane. Not that he was uneasy about the future, but he wanted to know at any cost why his projectile had deviated. But the projectile continued its course sideways to the moon, and with it the mass of things thrown out. 
Barbicane could even prove, by the elevations which served as landmarks upon the moon, which was only two thousand leagues distant, that its speed was becoming uniform, fresh proof that there was no fall. Its impulsive force still prevailed over the lunar attraction, but the projectile's course was certainly bringing it nearer to the moon, and they might hope that at a near point the weight, predominating, would cause a decided fall. The three friends, having nothing better to do, continued their observations, but they could not yet determine the topographical position of the satellite. Every relief was leveled under the reflection of the solar rays. They watched thus through the side windows until eight o'clock at night. The moon had grown so large in their eyes that it filled half of the firmament. The sun on one side and the orb of night on the other flooded the projectile with light. At that moment Barbicane thought he could estimate the distance which separated them from their aim at no more than seven hundred leagues. The speed of the projectile seemed to him to be more than two hundred yards, or about one hundred seventy leagues a second. Under the centripetal force, the base of the projectile tended toward the moon, but the centrifugal still prevailed, and it was probable that its rectilineal course would be changed to a curve of some sort the nature of which they could not at present determine. Barbicane was still seeking the solution of his insoluble problem. Hours passed without any result. The projectile was evidently nearing the moon, but it was also evident that it would never reach her. As to the nearest distance at which it would pass her, that must be the result of two forces, attraction and repulsion, affecting its motion. I ask but one thing said Michael, that we may pass near enough to penetrate her secrets. Cursed be the thing that caused our projectile to deviate from its course, cried Nicholl. And, as if a light had suddenly broken in upon his mind, Barbicane answered, Then cursed be the meteor which crossed our path. What? said Michael Arden. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicholl. I mean said Barbicane in a decided tone. I mean that our deviation is owing solely to our meeting with this erring body. But it did not even brush us as it passed, said Michael. What does that matter? Its mass compared to that of our projectile was enormous, and its attraction was enough to influence our course. So little? cried Nicholl. Yes, Nicholl, but however little it might be, replied Barbicane, in a distance of eighty-four thousand leagues, it wanted no more to make us miss the moon. End of chapter 9 The Consequences of a Deviation Recording by Scott Robbins